thank you for coming to our artist talk. Although I know some people were forced to. <laughs> but thank you anyways. Uh, I'm Wendy Welch, I'm director of the school and it's great to see a nice full house. And I'd like to thank the people who made the artist talk possible. And one of the things I talked about last semester is uh, about how we're running the art talk program without any funding. So I made uh, an appeal to our students, and several students came forward with uh, some funding so we can continue the artist talk. So I'd like to encourage anybody else if they'd like to make a small donation, even if it's 10 or $20, so we can keep the artist talk going. We have three more after this, but I'd like to, you know, there's always different artists I could ask to talk. So we have a donation box at the end. So but to the people who have uh, made a substantial donation of uh, $150 for an artist talk are Jill Ellert, uh, Sally Ireland, Kim and Alan Leslie, Nan Phillips, Paul Romia, and Terry Barton. So I think only Terry's here. Thank you very much. So some of you have might have met Sarah. She she gives uh, golden demos and to very fabulous uh, students caught quite high with that. And uh, Sarah is represented in Santa Monica, California, at the Ruth Bachhofner Gallery in Calgary at the Herringer Kiss Gallery and Vancouver at Trench Contemporary Art. Some of you who were here a couple of years ago, Craig Sibley, he's the director of Trench Contemporary Art. And he spoke about the gallery and he actually showed some of your work. Also. And um, her work has been exhibited nationally and at international art fairs in New York, Toronto, and Los Angeles, and in private and public collections in North America and the Middle East. So uh, I always feel a little awkward <coughs> reading people's bio because I, I much prefer just to talk about my experience of knowing the artists. And, I think uh, I first came across your work at the Fran Willis Gallery, and uh, I wrote about it in that Monday Magazine. <laughs> yeah, so it's really, I don't even know when that was, probably the late 90s, but it's been really exciting to see your work change as you, and you know, this is when you were, um, before you did your MFA, and then throughout the year, so I'm really excited to uh, hear you talk, so welcome. Okay. Thank you. met Wendy when I was in my late 20s and I was a model in and around Victoria uh, and I modeled for your classes. Oh, um, I remember that part. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for the introduction. Alright, I always find at the beginning I'm a little bit nervous so bear with me. I'll get over it. Uh, when I was preparing I think, well, how much preparation is there really? It's my work. That's <laughs> why I have to study something. <laughs> I just need to connect with what I make. Um, so I grew up, I was born in London, Ontario, and I grew up in North Bay, so a northern community, uh, with very little, I never went to the art gallery, wasn't aware of anything until about grade 11 I took an art class, learned a bit of art history, and um, 
I, I always spent more time doodling and doing the title pages than the science project. <laughs> so, and I was an athlete and I thought, well, I have to do sciences to be successful. So I did my first year at Queen's in science and then hated it and my parents suggested I apply to visual arts. So uh, my first slide is one of the ver very first paintings I ever did and it's of our backyard. So I was, um, I only really knew of the group of seven and the impression. And it was a symbolic and meaningful because the sweatshirt of my first boyfriend is inside the gazebo. <laughs> I gave the painting to the boyfriend, which my dad harassed me about forever. Um, so then uh, at Queen's, uh, I first walked into Ontario Hall and there was this seed planted in me. I saw lots of big abstract expressionist work. It was really uh, the direction of the school at the time. And some, a seed was planted like, I want to make large work that affects people. That's basically what it was. So uh, it was a great school to be a part of because they only took 30 people per year. Uh, so you got a lot of individual attention. I got my own studio in my fourth year. Uh, totally dedicated. I didn't have to take it down half of a huge room. And so I really I worked in oils, mostly um, easel style painting. And that was the space right before when I graduated, when I realized how good I had it. <coughs> it was time to go out into the world and <laughs> figure out how to make money and do art. So these uh, this is a series of self-portraits I did in the bath. I took video stills and, and then they were large scale works. This is my first commercial show in North Bay, where I'm from. Um, and a Toronto outdoor show. It was something else to make that whole um, armature that the work was on. So I should have said at the beginning, I'm going to talk a little, about, little bit about my art history, but I'm going to focus more on my current practice. So this is just a lead up. And I find that I, terming it my art history, different phases of my life affect deeply the, the type of work that I do. So including these stages of my life. So tree planting to pay for university and always with a rolled up canvas and a bunch of paints in the back of my van. Painting on the dash of my van, <laughs> yeah. like really integrated into life, and I did tree spacing at North as well. So then I moved down to Seattle uh, when I graduated from Queens, and I've worked in so many different types of studios. So I worked with uh, friends on their organic farm, and my studio was in their potting shed uh, and an outdoor garage area and then I had a place on Capitol Hill in Seattle and it was really cool. It was a third story of this vegan hippie house uh, where they had all these drum circles and we could, I could draw and paint on the walls and I went around outlining shadows of plants and different shadows all around our apartment. Um, I participated in some of the uh, first Thursdays so we would do sort of a jump on the heels of the Thursday Art Walk and set up shows in the different warehouse buildings in the Pioneer Square area. So my, my hippie friends there, and that's my work in the back. And then I finally uh, got sick of living and working under the table, moved to Victoria, went through more of a hippie stage, living in the Highlands. So work related to nature, um, a cabin in the Chosen where I lived. There it is with the bathtub in the main room and an outhouse and everything. When I was in the Stinking Fish Studio tour out there, I would hang, hang the paintings on trees, nails on the trees. <laughs> I had to hope for good weather. Um, and then, so these are all the sort of build up, sort of like I'd exhibited in a pool hall and just doing any, anything to get my work out there and find out how to configure making a living and being an artist, having time to work. Um, so this is Bastion Square with my setup there. It was a good summer. Mm -hmm. So lots of pains. It was before 9-11, so 
people were generous, the tourists were generous with their money. Um, so then I worked with a mentor uh, in Victoria who many people here know, Bill Correas. And I made a transition from using references in my art to working in a more purist way, using gravity and um, saturation and speed, uh, all the elements of design within within the work. So Did you switch to a coat paint then, um, Sarah? Um, around there, yeah. So this was a really pivotal piece because underneath the abstract was a painting of maple trees. I carted this five by seven foot painting out in the chosen to Mathis Lake and carried it along the path and <laughs> painted this large painting of trees and then it scraped all over it. Um, this was in the article that Wendy wrote, one of the pieces oh, he talked about. Yeah. Yeah, so in 2004, uh, I met my husband, and um, that was, it, it, he's just been so supportive from the moment I met him, and so things escalated from that point. And um, I got my a gallery in Calgary in 2005, and in 2006 I did four solo exhibitions, Montreal, Toronto, Kelowna, and Calgary. So these are some of the paintings I did in that period. That's Kelton Pal. So when you say you got the gallery, do you want to talk a little bit about how that happened? Just briefly? Yeah, that's a huge conversation about approaching galleries. And I'll just say a little bit and then more at the end. Yeah, okay, yeah you sure. about that? Because, well, from the beginning, I decided I didn't want to be self-pitying artist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to be proactive, and I did some leadership training courses and things like that that helped me to find my voice and not be so shy and have a bit of a business sense about how I approached my work and what was possible. And so every, almost every gallery I ever worked with is because I went to the city, walked to the door, and met the person. And so I have a whole strategy, a lengthy strategy for approaching galleries, and I can go into more detail maybe during the question time. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this show in Montreal, I did this series of 8 by 12 foot paintings and got a BC Arts Council grant to make them. Uh, my husband built me this contraption, so it's on wheels. And um, it was eight feet wide, so I could roll over my paintings and do these broad drags, cores and drags. So he'd pull the cores and I'm laying on my stomach on a, <laughs> it looks like a weightlifting bench. And I say, uh, hurry up, slow down, stop. Um, <laughs> and the first time I ever did it, I didn't prepare ahead. So at the end, all there's all this paint that's collected on the scraper, right? This four foot wide scraper and bleh, right on the floor. <laughs> yeah, so it took us a week to install that show. We went to Montreal and um, stretched all those canvases. And, and then on the day of the opening, he proposed to me. Oh, <laughs> After I got married, you can only see this in retrospect, but all these paintings, they're so light. There's <laughs> 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 so real freedom and playfulness, but a clarity about what I'm doing and where I'm heading within the work. Uh, so I started my master's in 2007, and then during that year, I went to the LA Art Show with my gallery and came across this artist, work, Helen Lundeberg. And I mean, I could go on and on about different artists and painters whose work I really like. I've just included a few here. But I, I went from being really chaotic, I think, as a young artist. I wanted to paint every painting in each painting. And then started to distill and clarify and seeing the hard edge work of, of the California painters, and especially contemporary artists who are working now, like Olga Kahlberg, or um, well, I'll think of them later. But um, I really I find some resonance with that because I think there's so much 
about composition and how the whole history of, of the abstract expressionists and, and before that about pushing and pulling space and whether you want to engage with those uh, possibilities or push against them within your work. So I feel like I go back and forth between engaging with those possibilities and then refuting them. So more of the kind of newlywed paintings here. Um, it's not a good idea to do a solo show in the middle of a masters. I learned. This is this is the show I did. Um, so let's see. So I, I went from being quite only formally based, and when I did my master's at UVic, I started to give myself license to intentionally <coughs> use references within my work, and I uh, had seen a circus, a circus soleil, and really connected with that, and, and thought about the performative aspects of painting, how physical it is when you work on a large scale, and how you use the contraption, and just felt some sort of connection with the, the circus acrobatics, and the amount of practice it takes to, um, to what's the word, I want to say, execute these death-defying feats <laughs> and how they make it look so um, so, so uh, effortless. So that was, especially in this painting here, was um, one of the inspiring uh, elements to my thesis. This is a small painting called Big Top. Uh, so I, I actually used reclaimed paintings, paintings that I thought were throwaways in a lot of my master's work. And just all of a sudden saw new directions that I could take with them. Um, started to insert a formal geometry and these hard edges that were scraped and raised and I'm still addicted. Like I, use, I go through so much tape to make paintings. Okay. So Sarah, a lot of your work is, it seems to be about discovering what paint can do mm -hmm. and the possibilities of paint. I'm wondering if you do a lot of tests, like experiments to find out, or do you just go directly and to the I go directly, I just love the thrill. Happens, yeah. Like there's a lot of paintings that don't work out, but yeah. I just, I can't be thinking about if I'm wasting canvas or paint. Yeah. So you just try out a lot of new things and you don't know whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then having the discernment to see what has worked. And uh, I've learned to paint far out in front of shows so that I can look back and say, these are the standout paintings. Because mm -hmm. when I'm in the middle of it, I think they're all great. <laughs> so that last painting was on three panels, was it? Yeah. Okay. And it's canvas stretched over um, a cradle? Well, I work that way. I call them hardback stretchers. Okay. Yeah. So I work on the floor on a hardback stretcher so I can walk on it. I can scrape against it. It doesn't show the the um, gusset lines or mm -hmm. the stretcher bar lines. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one is all owned by a Saudi princess. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, and then so I graduated from my master's and went to Europe for two and a half months. And I got to see the, all the work of the Venice Biennale. I went to every major city and every museum. And by the end, I had such bad shin splints. And <laughs> I didn't even think I wanted to uh, muster the effort to go into the Tate. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this is a hard edge painter whose work I really loved in Berlin. And I saw this light store. You may have seen it, Art of Mind in Zurich. And it really affected me. Just was so, was so formally aesthetic and so I started to integrate ideas around light and <coughs> the geometry of these series of photographs that I took into my work um, and the synchronicity with my life was that we bought a hundred year old house in Nanaimo and started to renovate it, we lifted it, we moved it forward, blasted and, and uh, just 
went full, full throttle into this house renovation. So uh, inevitably there were fixtures in my studio, toilets, sinks, <laughs> and eventually I grabbed, grabbed them and went, oh, which, what would it be like if, and I started to place them on the canvas. And so there, there was this um, resonance for me and the physicality of gathering a shape from a real thing and ideas around um, Duchamp and um, the ready-made, how that kind of played in. Oh, there's a painting further up that will show that. That's the, I like that picture. It's supposed to be uh, hazy. It makes me think of all the dust that was picked up when we sanded those floors. <laughs> turning three next month, so about three years ago or so, and I was determined not to do cheesy pregnancy art. <laughs> uh, but it's just such a powerful experience, right? It just, I did certain shapes, and in retrospect, I can see umbilical cords and all sorts of things. <laughs> but there was already a relationship for me to the body, and so I've been exploring that further about shapes relating to the organic, uh, the organs of our body and the workings of our body and our feelings about self-esteem with the body and the changing phases of the body through life. Uh, so that painting there, Sinister Virgin, <coughs> uh, the one on the left, as you can see, there is two toilet parts in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you still using the contraption? No, the studio I've been in has uh, posts in it, so it wasn't wide enough. Oh, okay. But I'm just, we're renovating and turning uh, a building, an outbuilding into my studio, and I'll be able to use it again. Oh, okay. So I'm kind of excited about Because I was that. just thinking, you know, talking about walking <coughs> and you're painting, and you're using the contraption, and your body is literally yeah. going in the painting, like over the painting. Yeah. Yeah, it was always so exciting. I mean, I've become very... I don't know, like very clear and concise about what I want out of the painting. So, you know, when I'm working in a way that's more chaotic, I still, I feel like I have to put it into a box. Or, and, and all the painters whose work I really like have that element to it, where if there's a bunch of pattern or texture, it's contained somehow and it plays off with other elements so that creates many dimensions within the, the field of the painting. Um, Sarah, excuse me for a second. I was wondering if you could tell, talk a little bit about the title of your works. Sure. Is there one in particular? That well, I'm just curious about how you, you decide after, during, uh, do you linger? <coughs> I sometimes take notes while I'm working so that I come from a place where I'm really present to the process of painting feelings that were going on instead of in retrospect. So I do a bit of both. Thank you. And, and one thing that isn't coming across in the slides when you, when you see the work for real is uh, Sarah also uses iridescent paint. Uh, so there's these really beautiful transparencies and um, what's the other it's word? Called called interference. Interference, yeah. yes. Where they have the, the color has a flip to it. It's absolutely amazing. And of course that doesn't come across in a photograph. Yeah. But it creates these, I can see why you maybe you called that the milk is opaque. Uh, you know, it's talking about the, the transparency of the density of paint. Yeah, yeah, there's connections to the formality of paint. And uh, since I did the <coughs> masters, I, I feel like there was a natural progression from uh, being really formal about my work to I can't help but find some deeper meaning now. Uh, I think that's maybe what a master's does to you. But, um, so I try and work in a metaphorical way as well, and, and it's so interwoven with the realities of my life. But I still have the intention that the painting, when it's a finished work, that it, it's uh, subjective. So you can bring your own eye to it and see your own set of metaphors and, and reads. 
Mr. Virtues, so there was a student here who did a poem about this painting, unbeknownst to me, and then talked to me about it, and I just wanted to read it because I really love her poem. Who was the student? And I gapped on her name right when we started. I was stressing out about remembering her name because I didn't write it down. Oh, I think it was Serena. Serena. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Serena Zapp. Yes. And this is her blog. It's a sinister virtue, ethereal textile, dew on the threads of a west coast spider's web, tranquil in moss splashes, who undulate in medium, who curve in the earnest play, who bend through the collaboration of human and pigment. We enter confident, reassured by the norms bestowed upon us by the generations that came before. We enter the solidity of pristine virtue, only to awake to the hard, violent reality violet reality, uh, led by our naive following of right, through the neutral meander, to be electrified by the metallic realization that all is not as we were told, that the milk is opaque, that the slender silence of the sparkling web connects the sinister to cloudy virtue. But what to make of this? What to make of the hoop, flat, sweet rose grounded to the earth? Is this our nature? Is this our birth? Do we begin sweetly, only to awaken disillusion? In the end, can we create anew, or at the very least escape with our loved ones, familiar hands held tight? So intense. Like, that was just right on the mark as to what was going on in our life, and we never met each other. I thought that was really something else. Okay, sorry, I just have to get back into the Slideshow. Awesome. I think that was a project where they had to write a little bit of artwork. So it's interesting to hear about people's interpretations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that it had a balance between the description of the painting and the metaphor connected to it. And then, of course, stayed in my house. <laughs> Evidence of child. <laughs> I'm very much aware that in the academic world of art, it's not. It's a bit against the grain to discuss your personal life. Um, but I've come to be able to claim that and declare it. And it's just so strong for me. Something, if I didn't share that part of it, I would feel like I wasn't being honest. Uh, so this is uh, work at the Campbell River Art Gallery in the spring last year. Quacky um, Green Girl and one of the other paintings that you'll see, Pinky Honey, are, this is perfectly in both uh, nicknames that I had my family and friends call me when I was a toddler, you know, kind of up to age six. Those were my nicknames. So <laughs> some of the color choices and you know they're very much related to um, witnessing my own daughter and feeling those the depth of love I have for her, but also connecting with a big girl and some of those pastel colors that I might not otherwise allow myself to use. So there we are, the transition to motherhood and the commitment to painting. Mm -hmm. I, I slowed down tremendously, like I was very prolific before. It was a huge transition for me to find the time and figure out how I could navigate my life. <coughs> it was easier when she was that little because she couldn't even roll over yet. I could leave her to sleep on my couch in the studio. <laughs> how did you get her lace pattern on the painting? Uh, it's stenciled on, so the lace is laid on, and then I use viscous gels with the spatula, scrape over it to make it perfect, and then take the lace back off, put it in a bucket of water, and clean it and reuse it. So the lace started to come into my work. I was mostly thinking you know, paint in painterly terms. Uh, I want to create more pattern, more um, fields of dimension in the work, and I grabbed for lace. The timing was such that it was just when we had bought this house, I was becoming truly a housewife and having a 
be. So uh, metaphorically, it just tied in in a really nice way to what was happening in my life. The releaseless plate is dimension. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it sits comes. raised off the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. Heavy gel. <laughs> So I have some other videos that I'm going to go to after this, and I, if you've looked on my website, some of them are posted. I'm three years behind on my website, though, so you can, see, you can go there and look at those ones, and I'll show you some of the newer ones, but the, the raised parts, the, the flip and some of the colors, the viscosity and sheen, because I'm really interested in sheen, and so there's matte areas that bump up against glossy areas, and, um, <coughs> and thinking about dichotomies in the work, and I think that for me it makes a painting more interesting when uh, neutrality bumps up against saturation and texture bumps up against flat, flatness. Um, so I'm thinking in those ways when I'm like, So you can see from that one the iridescence and the, the flat areas. And, <coughs> This past fall, I went to the Art Gallery of Calgary and they hung seven paintings, part of a group show about domesticity. Oh, it's such a nice thing um, internal dichotomies, I guess, uh, the internal struggles between making sure my family, my daughter is happy and getting that time to paint and sort of that back and forth. So those were some of the factors that related to those dichotomies in paint and how I tied them together. So this is uh, the Nanaimo Art Gallery, a body of work that I did. Sometimes it slows down when you go full screen. Oh. Yeah. As you can see, the lake's a lot more there. So. Did you do this video? Yeah, after doing every show, I go and I'll do a whole video. Try not to breathe too heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Just silent. This one I thought I was really clever. You see that shape that goes around? It looks like an upside down beaker. It's the exact color and measure of the tape that I used to make all my paintings. So I was feeling quite <coughs> clever there. And then this was the first show that I integrated a painterly action, so I felt like I wanted to expose the moments in the studio, the moments of uncertainty and elation, the thrill of paint when it's live. And so these are, this is an armature made from parts <coughs> of my daughter's crib. And I did a pour over this found bone, which I'll talk about. The found bone has to do with those other linear, more hard edge pieces. Double Life is the latest exhibition at the Campbell River Art Gallery, entwined with her personal narrative, creating metaphorical food out of a curious combination of acrylics. My life 
becomes enmeshed with this, the artwork. Even though I'm not a representational artist, I'm not directly uh, you know, painting pictures of myself and my child, uh, the shapes, the, the, the um, emotional content is, is directly related to my feelings of love for my child and the, and the, the tensions of trying to, to make sure that her needs are met and everyone's happy in the family and yet I still get my time in the studio. <coughs> this exhibit is a series of large-scale acrylic paintings and is an exploration of media and technique informed by objects of personal and symbolic significance. This painting behind me is one of my ultimate favorite I love how it has these clusters that link to one another. The organic shapes have a relationship with many creatures, they're anthropomorphic, and then they have those delicate elements of lace to them. An extra dimension to the show is a recording of the artist at work in her studio. Sarah Robichaud was offering a two-day workshop called Acrylic Skins, a Contemporary Approach in May. You can contact this website for more information. Double Life runs at the Campbell River Art Gallery until June 7th. In Campbell River, I'm Margie Greaves. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the slideshow. So I started that. Um, does anyone know how to start this up again and it will stay on this slide? No more. Because <laughs> last time I had to go all the way back. Yeah. Yeah. So I started that performance by unrolling the skin, which was the tablecloth. So that tablecloth was made of paint. Um, and so it was really neat like to roll it out and then peeling it off and hearing the, the sound of it letting go off the plastic. Um, laid it on the table and then went about serving all those delectable objects made of paint. When I give my gold lectures, I always relate different mediums and gels to food. One has the viscosity of butter, the other's like icing. So it was natural to head in this direction, I guess. So the glass of milk was paint? Yeah, everything was paint, except for the dishes themselves. Mm -hmm. And how did you stop Emily from drinking and eating that? Well, that was the interesting thing, because my husband was going to take her away, and then he was sitting in the background, and it seemed like everything was going pretty well. She just knew not to go in there, right? There was just this unsaid thing, like I was maybe posturing in a certain way. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty neat. And so the curator at the, the um, Art Gallery of Calgary had seen that and wanted me to do a performance there, but she was certain she wanted to include my daughter. So we flew out there together. And I'll show you a bit of that video too. Um, I already got to the slideshow camera, so I'll do that. Um, so part of the double life work was also this hard edge work, um, and the bone that you saw poured over, I had found that on a beach near my home, and was compelled to pick it up. It was a, uh, it felt like I shouldn't pick it up, and so I put it under my jacket, and <laughs> I don't know, it just felt weird taking this thing home, it was big. And I strung it up into my studio and used the spotlight to cast a shadow. And that was, um, I guess, a formal play in these paintings. So this has got the negative space of the bone in it. Uh, and there's the bone again with, with my daughter. Um, yeah, so there, there were also... It was a tough winter for us, and we had a death in the family, and somehow using the bone and all these brilliant colors cheered me up. So there was a relationship to some sort of morbid and loss, but also to rejuvenation and um, happiness, hope. So there we have some person in front of that painting. I also use a lot of raw canvas, like I consider the raw canvas as uh, one of the colors in the paintings. And I really like exposing the weave of the canvas and how that plays out. And 
using canvas colored paint as well to push the envelope. So that pale color there, Sarah, that's the raw canvas, mm -hmm. that pale gray. It looks like pale gray, right? Yeah, the, the color, well, that's <coughs> false here. here. Wow. Is it a linen canvas? No, just a cotton duck canvas. A heavier gauge or heavier duck because for the painting. I'll just run through a few more images and show you some video and then we can do questions. I feel like that video said a lot, so <laughs> I can just Yeah, so it was really a new realm to I had a whole script that I wrote out and I was very specific about the order and how I served the meal and So was there audience when you up, were doing this? late at night, all night thinking about it. <laughs> there was an audience while you were doing this? Yeah. Not a housewife dress there. <laughs> it's a little bit loosey. <laughs> what kind of response did you get from people? Oh, they love it. Like at the openings, um, just to see the paint and to observe uh, that kind of the artists engaged in their work. I think that was really interesting. I mean, Campbell River. Maybe we had 20 people there. They don't get a lot of people out to their openings, so it was a good practice run. Because <laughs> then at the Art Gallery of Calgary, it was packed. Like, there's four floors, and the place was packed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just did a, an iteration of it. I just did a 10-minute segment. We did the formal video piece separate on the day before. Yeah, so that's what the install looked like mm -hmm. in Calgary. And show you a bit of that video. And after the questions, we have tea and beer and wine. If people want to linger mm -hmm. on and talk to Sarah informally, mm -hmm. that's also an option. Then we'll bring some paint. <laughs> yeah, I, I did bring a jello mold with some paint in it to show you. Uh, so on that screen there, they, they, they filmed this video here. My mom was amazed we can't even get Wi-Fi here in this building in 1921. It's, you know, it's a miracle, really. Because <laughs> our modem is upstairs. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's not really working. <laughs> oh yeah, so it's um see the icon on the top? Oh yeah, it's not giving me you try it again. You need a few bars. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, see. Oh yeah, there I got another bar. So let's try again. <laughs> Back to I have a, a mailing list if you want to sign up for a mailing list to find out about shows. And I guess it's not working. Well, the video is five minutes. Yeah, I put in the password. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. I guess the signal isn't strong enough to download it. Yeah, you don't worry about that. Uh, email me if you want to see it and I'll send you the password, I guess. <laughs> It's kind of similar to the Campbell River one, but it's really neat because there's a, a banter between my daughter and I that's just so precious, and it'll be really neat someday for her to do that. Oh, okay, there. See? And you're wearing those shoes? Yeah. Yeah, so the peeling of them. Right there, but yeah, I'm gonna pull it off in a minute. It's just 
taking forever to get to that How do I do that? Like there's a HD button in the bottom right hand corner. Like uh, run your mouse over it. Up 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 a bit. Yeah. See the blue HD? Nope, down. Where it says HD. Oh yeah. <coughs> like that? No. Can you click on it? Oh yeah, there you go. No, that's that's volume. But not HD. Oh, HD, okay, okay. Thank you. 
dried components that I could add to, too, and I put the ice cubes in there and pour it on top of it. I'd like to jump ahead, but it's not really this thing, so. Take my card and email me if you want to see more of it. Then this winter I did, I kind of moved from the kitchen to, from ingestion and digestion to <laughs> elimination in a way. A natural progression. Yeah, so I, I did this installation at this historic building in Nanaimo and did a couple pours into the toilet and the sink and this, this potty here. So um, that, was, that was a fun you know, like no pressure situation, just to experiment. So some of these, I served uh, donuts with sprinkles on and, and coffee and, to aid the process. People came and hung out with me and we sat on the couch and it was just a lovely weekend. Yeah, I'll finish with that And <coughs> uh, maybe we can get the lights on again. And I'll put this at the table back there. But this, like, after all this time, and that's the sink that I did, I poured a whole, filled an entire sink, and I put a resist on it first, so I'm probably going to have to wait. I don't know if it'll ever dry, but I plan on totally <coughs> taking it out. And I haven't engaged in a sculptural practice, but I have ideas, and I'm not sure how I'm going to execute them quite yet. But this is just so fun to touch, so feel free. I'll put it over there, and you can touch it. Um, and next I have a show in Calgary at the Herringer Gist Gallery in October. Um, I think I'm going to call it Mother Tongue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I'm working on. That's, I guess that's the end of the formal um, part, but I'll take questions. Was that what got you involved with Golden, or did it work the other way around? Uh, it worked the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, so I started working with them, and I, when I did their training, they take you to, um, they do actually three phases of training, but one of them was at a factory in New York, upstate New York. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, I wonder, it's so exciting, all these new mediums, will I use them in my work? And I didn't, because I was already kind of far enough down my rabbit hole of how I was painting and what I was using. But now I'm using more of them when I'm doing these food components and sculptural painted elements. So who knows what will happen next. Oh, excuse me. She Sorry, the question. other question was, um, have you ever noticed, um, or uh, do you ever worry about Emily putting her own additions to your paintings when you're not looking with a pen or something? She's not around them at that stage. She knows, actually. You know those whales that uh, have been painted on around mm -hmm. Vancouver and Victoria? So we were at the ferry terminal. She saw one of them, and she said to me very sternly, don't touch that mom in the heart. Oh, I just wanted to know what the gel jelly mold thing is made. Oh, did, uh, you know your part of oh. it? This is clear tar gel. Clear tar gel. Yeah. With, okay, and so then state cordons. Yeah, cordons. So that was part of the performance I did in Calgary. This is the resulting. And I, I titled the piece, uh, My Grandmother's Forgotten Jell O Mold and Other Confections. <laughs> this um, how much preparation do you have for your paintings? Like, do you draw beforehand? Do you have a 
an idea of what they're going to look like, or are they really completely process oriented, and they just you just start with a blank canvas and just with an idea, and that's it, and go from there. Or? Usually, the, the second. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, creating parameters and planning out compositions is an earlier sort of stage. Like, I feel like I've painted enough that it's it's integrated, it's internal, and I just trust my own. You know, and I, I have breakthroughs and I have messes. Also, I just wanted to mention, in case anyone is interested, the show up here is called uh, Drawing Beneath the Surface, and there's some information about the artists, it's three artists, in case you haven't seen the show before, and you want to know more, we have um, a list of all the titles, not to take away from you, Sarah, but mm -hmm. people yeah, well, are curious. Yeah, that people start moving around and the information <laughs> Sarah, I don't really have a question as much as, as much as a, it's a comment about your work. And uh, ever since the color paint was invented, what, in the 50s? I believe in the 50s, late 50s. Um, there's been this kind of dialogue, or not a dialogue, but a, a battle between oil painters and acrylic painters. And uh, when I was going to school, we mostly all painted in oil. Now people are painting in oil and painting acrylic. But at the same time, what was always happening is that... <coughs> People were trying to make acrylic paint do what oil paint did. They wanted, oh, if I can just uh, paint better with this acrylic paint, it will look exactly like an oil, as if that was the good thing. The goal. Yeah, that's the goal, to make your acrylic paint look like oil paint. The, the, the fantastic thing about your work, and, and we can't see it in the slides, is the ones that are purple, for instance, you see a little bit of purple, when you go to the other side, you actually see green in that paint, because it's, it's one of those interference paint, paints that goes two colors depending on where you are. And we saw a number of paintings where you talk about this extreme contrast between flat and sheen, and that's a real, real powerful thing in your work. I guess the, the comment I want to make is you couldn't make these paintings in oil. No. Right? no. And the so technology of yeah. paint is just multiplied. It's so exponential right now. Yeah. So even the abstract expressionists yeah. who were uh, cutting edge in their time, those paintings, like, Contemporary painters who are using acrylic have just surpassed and made such interesting work because yep. of what's available yep. now. Yep. So yeah. that, that's the it's irony really of it, that, it, that it's really true, hasn't it? That you yeah. could not make the acrylic paints, those paintings, in oil paints. Yeah. Which is a yes. fantastic thing that has, uh, and I think that you, you have that material to work with, otherwise you would never have been able to make these paintings, is the point mm -hmm. I'm trying to make there. Mm -hmm. If you ever get a chance to see one of these paintings, they can be really <coughs> like they're, they're unbelievably beautiful. The internet has slowed down again, so sorry about that. I'm sorry. I don't get to see any more videos. Mm -hmm. Well, I also, like, uh, in closing, I'd like to say it's so fun to be here. I feel like Visa is my family, even though I only taught here for a couple of years. It's so many familiar faces. It's such a friendly fantastic creative incubator. So thanks for having me and feel free to come up and ask me questions.